Howdy. We're going to keep talking about defects today, and we're going to start talking about planar defects. Um, so whereas before we were thinking about either points or line, these are extended defects um, that uh, represent two-dimensional uh, defects. Um, so they include things like grain boundaries and stacking faults. Um, and when we talk about these, sometimes it's helpful to have an analog. Um, and so we can look at things like these. Um, these are bubble raft models. And so this is basically just um, you know, a bunch of bubbles on the surface of material. Um, but you could, you could treat it as if you were staring at the surface of a three-dimensional crystal. Um, because just like atoms, bubbles tend to um, uh, adopt a nice close-packed um, structure. And so we can see that if we do this right, in some cases there are little flaws. So maybe there are vacancies over here. Um, but there are also uh, extended defects. And so if I kind of trace a line along here, I see that you know, up here there's, there's a particular packing. And it has uh, you know, something that I could identify as lattice parameters. Um, and below, there's the identical packing. Um, but those last parameters are rotated with respect to the lattice parameters above. Um, and so this is the analog of what a grain boundary looks like. So I would call this uh, grain number one, maybe. And this is grain number two. Um, and this thing, the, the interface between the two grains, uh, is the grain boundary itself. And so again, here I'm just looking at a line, but if we think about this as a three-dimensional crystal, that line would extend into and out of the surface, and so that would be the grain boundary. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, grain boundaries and other kind of two-dimensional defects today. And we're going to talk a little bit about why do we care, uh, surface energy, so ultimately these things form to minimize the surface energy of the system. Uh, we're going to kind of go through a bit of a catalog of different types of interfaces. Um, but we're going we're gonna to talk um, quite extensively about grain boundaries, different general and special grain boundaries, um, interphase grain boundaries, so a boundary between two different phases. And then we'll uh, mention some details on magnetic domain boundaries later on. Um, and again, for more information, there's a great resource online um, that has a bunch of uh, you know, graphical pictures of these things, but also gives more details than we're going to be able to go into today. Um, so here we are, we're talking about planar defects. Um, why do we care? Well, grain boundaries, again, they dominate uh, how a material behaves with certain kind of properties. Um, and so particularly if we think about things like corrosion resistance or stress corrosion cracking or even, even creep, total elongation to failure, these are all things that are dominated um, especially by how materials behave uh, along the grain boundaries. Um, and so, for example, uh, corrosion, you know, this grain boundary could, could uh, be identified as a point of weakness, um, and it could preferentially oxidize or corrode along that grain boundary, and that could cause um, a crack to propagate into the material. And so we might not actually care about um, the corrosion resistance of a perfect single crystal, what might actually be the thing that causes our material to fail at the end of the day um, is how that grain boundary behaves. Um, furthermore, there's this whole uh, approach that's referred to as grain boundary engineering. So again, it turns out that certain mechanical properties are dominated um, by which um, grain boundaries are present in the system between two neighboring grains. Um, and those grain boundary orientations and populations are affected by the thermomechanical history of the sample. Um, so this is an example of a cast ingot of copper. Um, so it directionally solidified from the outside edge inwards, um, and certain kind of grains outcompeted and outgrew other grains, and so those are the ones that um, grew all the way into the interior of the sample. Um, but, but this obviously had some effect. I see a smaller grain size towards the edge than I do uh, inside. Um, and, and how I heat treat, how I cool, and what kind of stresses I apply during that process um, could have a very strong impact on what this microstructure um, can look like. Um, so as an example, if I take um, a particular kind of an alloy um, and I heat it up and I apply different kind of loads in a, sp in a sp uh, specific way, um, then I might affect the total population or the density of certain very low energy special grain boundaries. Um, and so that's what this is showing. You know, if I initially have the material, all these red lines are that particular kind of grain boundary. I have some of them, but not a lot. Um, but if I process the material in a certain way, I can create a very high density of a certain type of grain boundary. And again, that would let me um, change something about the mechanical properties of the material. So in order to talk about that, to figure out how to do it, um, and to figure out how to characterize that processing technique, 
again, we need to be able to describe different kinds of, of grain boundaries. What is special about these ones that I've illustrated with a red line? Um, and as a final example, uh, we can think a lot about uh, chemical segregation or, or even diffusion. If I, if I think about um, how likely is it for a, a chemical species to diffuse through some polycrystalline layer, or if I think about you know, some dopants uh, in a material, where are they going to end up? You know, again, these are both things that are dominated by grain boundaries. So in a lot of cases, grain boundaries are, um, they're already a relatively high energy uh, position in the lattice uh, or, or in the, in the system. Um, and so uh, different kind of point defects, um, you know, extrinsic uh, defects particularly will tend to segregate and find their way to those um, external grain boundaries. Um, and similarly, if I think about how uh, atoms can move through a material, um, in certain cases, those grain boundaries can be um, highways that uh, have very high transport, or in other cases, they could have very low transport. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's just an example of um, how the overall property of the bulk material is, in fact, more dominated in some cases by um, what happens along the grain boundaries than what happens within that perfect single crystal itself. So the, the, when we think about uh, grain boundaries um, or any kind of these planar defects, um, we always think about it in terms of the overall uh, energy of the system. Um, and the uh, interfacial energy uh, shows up uh, some term here where, where gamma is the surface or the interfacial energy. And, and dA uh, is the incremental increase in exposed area. Um, so if a material is trying to minimize its overall energy, um, then uh, interfaces that have low surface energies tend to be exposed. Um, and the material also uh, is going to reconfigure itself to minimize that total um, exposed uh, amount of area. Um, and again, we can see this pretty clearly in analog. So if you think about um, bubbles, you know, if we look at any particular junction, so these are bubbles that are trapped um, within, two, um, within two planes, so basically confined to a sheet. Um, and if we look at that, um, we tend to see these 120 degree um, angles. Um, and this is because, you know, we have uh, three convergent bubble films and they're all sort of pulling outwards. And so that, that contact angle um, is basically adjusting itself to minimize the overall energy. And we can view this um, as there basically being um, uh, tension uh, in all of these uh, directions. And so that will result because it's the same, um, it's the same thing in each of these three quadrants, uh, sorry, uh, each of these three portions, um, that'll result in these 120 degree angles. Similarly, if we move to three dimensions, um, we kind of have a, a, an internal angle here um, where the angle uh, between the edges is the angle um, that we see inside a tetrahedron, so 109.5 degrees. Um, so this is really just going to say that um, surfaces uh, are going to move around and adjust in the system to minimize the overall energy. Uh, and when those surfaces are all um, equal, then we tend to have equal angles. Um, but in uh, real materials, we, we, we have different kind of grain boundaries. And so these angles are not always going to be um, uh, equally spaced. Um, and so just in order to explore that in a little bit more detail, oops, um, different materials. So they could be, uh, they could be liquids or they could be uh, surfaces of solid um, have a, a different uh, surface free energy. So this is in units of energy uh, per area. Um, and so this is telling us, uh, what is the additional energy that exists in the system when you have that exposed surface? Um, so very low energy things tend to, uh, wet very well, but, you know, again, the main takeaway that I'd like you to think about from this, um, is that the angles, uh, between different kind of grains. So let's say I have, um, a, a grain of alpha here, another grain of alpha, and then a, a grain of a different phase. Um, these angles that I see between the different surfaces, uh, they're dominated by the energy balance that's associated with these surface free energy terms. Um, and so if we look at a polycrystalline material and we measure these uh, angles, then we can tell something about those uh, interfacial energies um, in the system.
so there's a large variety of different interfaces that we might talk about. Um, and here we're just going to kind of talk about a general classification scheme. Uh, and the first thing that we would think about is what is on either side of the interface. And so in both these cases, this is an interface. Um, and if I have uh, two of the same thing, so maybe this is crystalline iron and crystalline iron, um, then that's a homophase, so same phase interface. Um, versus if I have two different things, let's say iron, and then maybe this is an iron carbide precipitate, or maybe it's a nickel alloy. Um, this would be a heterophase or interphase interface. And that just means that they have different phases, different crystalline materials on either side of that interface. So the next question is, how are the lattices oriented on each side of the interface? And so if those lattices are basically um, lined up and continuous across the interface, um, so these are our lattice vectors, and if they're pointing in the same direction on both sides of that interface, um, then I have certain kind of defaults, uh, certain kind of uh, defects. Um, and so these could include things like stacking faults, antiphase boundaries, um, and if the lattice vectors are continuous and uh, pointing in the same direction across a heterophase interface, then I would call that a coherent grain boundary. Um, again, we're going to go into a lot more details of, and examples of each of these later on. Um, the point of this slide is just to kind of classify all these different kind of interfaces. Um, what about if uh, they're not pointing in the same direction? Um, so again, if, if I'm looking at two different phases, this is just called an incoherent grain boundary. That means that um, there's no special relationship between uh, the uh, orientation on one side and on the other side of that interface uh, boundary. That's the, the basically the general case. Um, if I'm looking at a homophase boundary, so let's say I have polycrystalline iron, for example, I have many, many different individual grains of iron, and in general, the boundary, um, a grain boundary, I'm going to have a different orientation on one side than I am on the other side of the boundary. Um, so within that case, I could have things that are symmetric, so they're both kind of rotated in the same amount and in, in, in opposite directions on either side of that boundary. I could have something like asymmetric, and that's what's shown here, where one of them is maybe rotated more um, than the other. That's the general case. Or I could have very special things. I could have things that we talk call uh, twin grain boundaries or low angle grain boundaries. Um, but these are all examples of uh, grain boundaries, so interfaces um, between two uh, of the same phase. And again, we're going to give examples of each of these. Um, so the first thing is, let's distinguish um, the left side from the right side. So again, homophase is an example of something where on either side of the boundary, and so this is the interface we're looking at here, we have the same crystalline phase. It's just oriented in a different way. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is actually an example of a twin boundary, but it's, it's a homophase because I have the same material, let's call it material X, on the left hand and on the right hand side of that interface. Um, and we could tell that in this case, so these are transmission electron microscope images. We can tell that because the lattice is exactly the same, it's just oriented differently uh, on either side. And you can kind of see it has this, this mirror uh, orientation relationship. And so that's what makes this a twin boundary. Um, if I look at a different case, you know, maybe I look at a boundary like this, I might see one material on one side and a different material on a different side. Um, so this is an example where um, people worked really, really hard to grow as perfect of an interface as possible between these two materials, but the materials themselves are different. So I have silicon on one side and gallium arsenide on another side. So this is an example of a heterophase boundary. Um, however, the crystal, the lattice, the lattices are almost uh, continuous across it. That's what um, uh, we're showing in the diffraction image over here. Um, and so this is what we'll call an epitaxial relationship. So that just means that even though um, I have two different crystals, um, I'm basically growing something that has a coherent grain boundary, um, and it's almost as if uh, you know this is one continuous crystal. So that's an example of heteroepitaxy. Um, however, in our most general uh, classification scheme, these are heterophase boundaries because I have something different on one side versus the other side of that interface.
Okay, so if we go back to our uh, index, we're going to give some additional example of, uh, of uh, planar defects that occur um, between two um, things uh, that are uh, both the same phase. So these are homophase boundaries. And the first thing we're going to talk about is a stacking fault. Now, if you remember back to your close pack structures, this is an example of an FCC lattice structure. Uh, we make these close pack structures um, by stacking together close pack layers in this alternating sequence, A, B, C, A, B, C, and so forth. And that A, B, C just refers to the, um, the position uh, of, of each of these um, sort of sequential layers. So I start off with a layer A, um, the next layer is a close pack layer and it's shifted over a little bit. And the third layer is again, another close pack layer and it's shifted over a little bit further. Um, and then by the time I get back to the following layer, it's the same as that first layer. And so that's what I mean by A, B, C, A, B, C. So a perfect FCC crystal would have this A, B, C, A, B, C packing sequence. Um, however, we could have something like this. And so if you start from the bottom up, you see A, B, C, A, B, C, whoops. So we're missing something right here, right? We're missing that A layer. And so this is what a stacking fault is. It's, it's when we have this um, structure uh, that is composed of um, basically close packed layers that are stacked in a particular sequence um, and they are out of sequence uh, right here. And so this is a planar defect, and we call that planar defect a stacking fault. Now, we could have a couple different kinds. So on the left-hand side, we see uh, a perfect crystal. On the right-hand side, there's an example where we're basically missing one. So I would see A, B, C, A, B. There should be a C here, but then we go back to A, B. We could have an inserted plane, A, B, C, A, B, A, C. So there's an extra plane here. Um, and the thing that I want you to look at is what happens at the very end of this extra half plane. So again, you know, the, this, this inserted plane, it is a plane, it's extending into and out of the screen, um, but it, it ends, it ends somewhere. And, and we've already seen this kind of a defect. So it ends at a line, and that line is an edge dislocation. Same thing here, at the end of this taken out plane, I have another edge dislocation. And so um, it, this, uh, this stacking fault sequence, it doesn't need to propagate all the way through um, the crystal. It could be limited to just one particular area and then bounded by uh, a dislocation loop. Um, and so we've actually kind of worked through an example of these before. If you think about having a FCC lattice and having this dislocation loop, we saw this when we were looking at dislocations, um, then that dislocation loop could be surrounding a missing plane uh, or an inverted plane. But, um, but you know, the top and the bottom surface would have some kind of a defect uh, between the two of them. So we could get a little bit more complicated, um, and we could have something that's called an antiphase boundary as well. So an antiphase boundary occurs in something where we have an ordered crystallographic lattice. So um, the original case where we were looking at these stacking fault sequence, even though the, the colors are yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, blue, that is just to indicate the stacking sequence. These were all atoms of the same type. So these were all, uh, for example, copper atoms. Um, antiphase boundaries occur in systems where we have some uh, ordered lattice. And so let's think about something like a copper gold alloy. Uh, and so in this case, uh, maybe copper is blue uh, and maybe gold is red. Um, and in cases like this, those copper and gold atoms like to arrange themselves in a particular order. Um, and so we can see they sort of are forming as checkerboard pattern. So what would happen if we had something like this stacking fault sequence, an extra half a plane, but, um, but, but these, uh, this material is an ordered uh, alloy. Um, and the thing that happens there is it's called an antiphase boundary. So I would recommend take a moment, pause the video, and sketch out this thing and what happens as we get to this kind of interface. Um, and what you should see, uh, this is sort of rotated 180 degrees relative to the picture here, um, but somewhere you're basically gonna have cases where instead of uh, a gray being lined up against a white, like you would expect,
a gray is lined up against a gray atom, and a white is lined up against a white. And so along this line here, we have this antiphase boundary. So where exactly the antiphase boundary occurs would happen would 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 depend on how you drew it. You know, it could also be extending downwards, but it has to be um, extending outwards somewhere um, from this uh, edge dislocation that's describing the extra half a plane of atoms. Um, and so again, we could have self-contained antiphase boundaries. Um, where the region uh, within uh, that antiphase boundary is uh, displaced relative to the region outside. Um, and so if we look at uh, the region here within this circle that's labeled C, we can basically see that, um, you know, it's, it's uh, we, can, we can view it as being uh, displaced one small step from the surrounding region B. And so we could use that to describe the displacement across this antiphase boundary. So if, if these are our lattice parameters up here, um, then this is a, a 100 shift, right? Because I, I have my, um, maybe this is U1, this one up here is U2. Uh, so this is shifting along the 100 direction um, half a lattice parameter. Um, and so that's, that's the displacement across this particular antiphase boundary. Um, so different kinds of lattices um, tend to be susceptible to different kinds of displacements uh, across them. Um, and so the displacement up here, you would describe using this uh, diagonal line. And so that's a 111 type uh, direction um, that has a magnitude of uh, A over 4. Uh, so that's all we're going to talk about here. The next video is going to go on to a whole bunch of different kind of uh, grain boundaries.